on behalf of Hamlin University, and with deep appreciation for our partnership with our co-sponsors, Common Ground Meditation Center and Clouds and Water Zen Center, and with gratitude for the presence of Ruth King, I give you a warm welcome on this blizzardy Arctic night. <laughs> I'm Mark Berkson. I teach Asian religions here at Hamlin University's Department of Religion, and we are a sponsor of tonight's event. And I am so grateful to all of you for braving this weather to come out here. I know what it took. I see the roads and everything, and I, I deeply appreciate it. And I'm delighted that you can join us to listen to, learn from, and talk with author, scholar, and teacher, Ruth King. Tonight, we will be educated, challenged, supported, and inspired by her words. Many of us have already benefited from her books, such as Mindful of Race, and those who have heard her speak are always transformed by the experience. There could not be a more important, relevant, timely topic than transforming racism. Issues related to race and racism are woven throughout the nation's history. and In fact, they predate the nation itself. But there has been an undeniably heightened sense of intensity and pain since the last election. We have been disabused of the illusion of inevitable progress, and we know that we cannot hope for the arc of history to bend on its own, inexorably in the direction of greater justice and inclusion. We have seen convulsions of hatred and division and a resurgence of white supremacy movement and hate crimes. We've witnessed painful exchanges at every level of government, and we have experienced the tragic results in our own communities. We currently stand just a few miles, for example, from the spot where Philando Castile was shot. And two days ago, I sent out an email to a neighborhood list advertising this event. Now, I got back many responses that were enthusiastic from people wanting to attend. But I also received one that shocked me. And it read, in its entirety, quote, please remove me from this PC liberal list. There is no such thing as racism. Only guys who stage hate crimes on themselves because of pure vanity, unquote. That was from someone who lives here, in the Midway area of St. Paul, my wonderful, diverse neighborhood. How is this possible? What do I do with this, and how do I respond? What do I do with the range of painful emotions that swept over me as I read that in disbelief. In other words, we have a lot of work to do. And Ruth King is here to help us with this vital work, guiding and supporting us as we look for a way forward. Her work acknowledges the complexity and many dimensions of racism, cultural, social, political, economic, and so on. But the core of her work on mind reading and what makes it so powerful is that it's true focus is the human heart and mind. Bringing in insights gleaned from meditation practice, along with her gifts as a writer and her willingness to challenge us directly, Ruth King's work helps us cultivate ways of seeing, observing, reflecting, and opening ourselves up that make transformation and healing possible. I am glad you are all here to benefit from her wisdom. And after her talk, there will be opportunities to ask questions, and engage in conversation. This opportunity would not be possible without the wonderful groups who came together to sponsor the event. Co-sponsors with the Religion Department here at Hamlin University are the Hedgman Center for Student Diversity, with thanks to Director Carlos Sneed and Associate Director Sharon Depew, and the Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Center, led by Associate Vice President for Inclusive Excellence, David Everett. And David is happy to report that Hamlin was one of 10 higher education institutions selected to house a Truth Racial Healing and Transformation Center with the aim, he said, quote, of moving the needle on the goal of erasing structural barriers to equal treatment and opportunity on campuses, in communities, and across the nation. David wanted me to let you know that the center will be hosting a panel discussion on Tuesday, March 12th on How Does Healing Begin, followed by Healing Circles on March 26th, 27th, and 28th to further explore healing from various perspectives. 
We want Ruth's visit to be a catalyst for ongoing conversation that continues long after this evening concludes. All of you are welcome to those events. I'd also like to recognize chaplain and director of the Wesley Center, Reverend Nancy Victor and Ray Bangarud, whose commitment to diversity and inclusion has enhanced our campus and made it a better place. And I want to pass on greetings from Hamlin's president, Dr. Fainice Miller. She regrets that she cannot be here. She has a long scheduled board retreat. Among the many admirable qualities brought to Hamlin's campus by Dr. Miller is a lifelong commitment to fighting for civil rights and justice. The issues we are discussing tonight are of utmost importance to her, and she wishes she could be here with us. Hamlin is delighted to partner with Common Ground Meditation Center and Clouds and Water Zen Center, our co-sponsors for tonight. How lucky we all are, all of us who live in the Twin Cities, to have two such wonderful communities that support practices that help people cultivate wisdom and compassion and that they think deeply about the connection between spiritual practice and social transformation. They have opened themselves up generously to our students over the years, and I know they have touched many lives at Hamlin. From Common Ground, I'd like to recognize guiding teacher and co-founder Mark Nunberg, co-founder Wynne Fricke, associate director Shelley Graff, and board chair Stacy McClendon, and board member Gabe Keller Flores. Shelley and Gabe put in a lot of work to make this event happen, so thanks to both of you, especially. Uh, Mark has been my teacher and friend for 19 years, and he has welcomed countless Hamlin students to the Common Ground during my time there. 19 years. I've aged, but he hasn't. Um, so that's what meditation does for you. Um, he has given Dharma talks to students, guided them in meditation, and answered their many questions with patience, wisdom, and humor. From Clouds and Water, I would like to recognize Carol Iwata, board member and one of the founders of Race, Love, and Liberation Lab at Clouds and Water, and her wife, Valerie Storr, and Lillian Aislin, the program and communication coordinator at Clouds. And I'd also like to recognize and thank guiding teacher Sosan Flynn, who's been a good friend for many years. Although she couldn't be here tonight, I want to express my gratitude because she, like Mark, has welcomed many Hamlin students over the years leading them in meditation, and giving us all illuminating teachings. I'd like to thank Kelly Rudney, Associate Director of Conference and Events Management, who helped with all the logistics and setup, and Adam King, who's here with us, making sure all goes well, Brian Johnson and Sophie Skilford, who are providing the sound tonight and recording the event, so you can tell your friends who couldn't be here that they'll have an opportunity to hear the talk. And Malia Glariton from Hamlin Catering, who will be providing us with assorted cookies, vegan brownies, and tea afterwards. So please stay for that. A couple of final things. Please remember to silence or turn off your cell phones. The bathrooms are out the door to the right around the corner near the front desk. And please stay for the reception where we'll eat and talk together. And Ruth King will be out there signing her books. They're also for sale at the table. Now please join me in welcoming Associate Director of Common Ground Meditation Center, Shelley Graff. Thanks, Mark, for such a lovely introduction. You said all the things. <laughs> yeah, I was reflecting on what I might say to introduce Ruth tonight. It's my honor to get to do that. And I was reflecting on, you know, how I could come up here and say all the normal things that people say when they talk about someone's bio, like where she lives and all her Dharma activities at Spirit Rock and IMS and um, the books that she's written and all these other wonderful things to say. But what was really moving in my heart is this journey that we've traveled with Ruth over, over the past year, from the time she came last March and um, engaged the Common Ground community in a two and a half day training, Mindful of Race, based on the material in her book, and just how that has really um, spurred us in a very positive direction. And it's not, it's been this constant love and nurturing energy that she provides, but also this kind of fearless um, pointing us in the direction of doing our own work. And I just noticed this even over the past week or more 
since Ruth and I have had many phone conversations, Zoom calls, text exchanges, it's that same sort of loving invitation that feels more like uh, a motherly expectation. Right? And you might have felt that last year at the training. She said, I expect you to continue to do this work. I'll come back if you're committed to doing this work for the next year. And that's been the consistent message, pointing us in the direction, the same direction the Buddha points us to. Like, this is our problem to solve. Right? We get to embrace these wonderful teachers we have, like Ruth, who can um, really share with us what it's like to include racial awakening, racism, our exploration about race and racism, in our full um, effort to awaken as human beings. And then we can have these wonderful events and shared values with Clouds and Water and Hamlin, Hamlin where we come together and feel the impact of Sangha, our community that's all doing the same thing and invested in the same journey. But it really, this work really points us back to our own Buddha nature, if you will. Our capacity to wake up, that's our job, right? It's our job. So that consistent message again and again and again, like this is yours to do. So I could say a lot of wonderful things about Ruth, but what I really want to say is thank you. Thank you for your presence in the world, for your fearless efforts over lifetimes, and for pointing us in the direction of the stars and the constellations. Thank you. Feeling um, very touched by the um, by your presence and this snow. <laughs> you know, I'm from California. I'm living in Charlotte, North Carolina. But um, the funny thing that I, you know, snow is kind of I'm I'm learning a lot about it now that I'm on the East Coast. But. Um, the interesting thing about snow is that it occupies. It, it, ta it, it occupies space. And um, you have to rearrange yourself in order to deal with it. You have to slow down, you have to, you know, it might take a parking place that was once available to you. You know, they, they almost seem like clumps of ancestors just kind of piling up and coming in the, they really do take up space. They require a certain attention and attending. And um, that's a lot of what this work is about, too. Our attention, our attending. So I'd like to begin um, by having us do something with each other before I begin to talk. And I ask you all to just stand up and free your hands up. <laughs> And I'd like for you to get face to face with someone that's nearby, but maybe you don't know them. But just turn around and get face to face with someone. Keep it real simple. It's okay to move, move around a little bit. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna be in silence here. So let me invite you to take a breath. Come into silence and take a breath. And just close your eyes for a minute. And I just want you to, to turn your attention inward just for a breath or two, just to settle here. And just uh, allowing yourself to soften just a little bit, wherever there might be any hold. And then gently open your eyes and look at the other person. Just a loving gaze without speaking. Just look. Soften and look. Look at this person that's your kin, or you know it or not. And then repeat out loud after me. If I didn't belong to you, I wouldn't be here. If you didn't belong to me, you wouldn't have come. Your heart and my heart 
our very old friends. So offer a bow or a hug or whatever you do. <laughs> and then one more time, turn to another person nearby. You can move around a little bit. Just go to another person. You can be in a trio, it's okay. Look around. Taking a breath here. Once again, looking at uh, the people that you're near, noticing how you're touched by them. Also noticing that this person probably has many stories about their lives that you have no, you can't even imagine the full of their lives, their brilliance, their disappointments, their traumas, their heartbreaks. Let's take in a breath here. And repeating again, if I didn't belong to you, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have come out in the snow. <laughs> if you didn't belong to me, you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't be here either. Your heart and my heart are very old friends. All right. And Offer a bow or a handshake or a hug or whatever you do. Have a seat. So taking a moment as you sit down and I want to invite some stillness just for a minute before I begin. I'd like you to close your eyes and settle into your seat, feeling a sense of inner balance as you sit. Maybe your both feet on the floor and not crossed, and certain alignment with your back and shoulders and head. And feeling that on the inside. And just dropping your attention into your body, this body sitting here, this heart. Perhaps there's some reverberation from looking at a few people. Let's see if you can notice how that is on the inside. Really taking your time to relax in with each exhale. Noticing the experience of settling. This place of inner stillness, I'd like to call upon my own ancestors to stand with me as I acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land on which we're sitting and doing this work. All of the native people who attended and cared for this land for us to, to be here. You may whisper their names, whether we know them or not. The gift of their love and seeding of the land is nurturing us. And we acknowledge that this event is being held on that land. and we recognize their continuing connection 
to the land, to the water, to the community. And we pay respect to the earth whose generous and life-sustaining resources have been exploited but continue to nurture us. we pay respect to the enslaved African people of this land who work the land and, and all of their descendants. And we recognize all of those that are sharing and continuing to struggle for liberation, especially a liberation of heart. And this includes wise elders, past, present, and future. So thank you again for, um, for this very gracious and generous welcome that I feel. Um, a question I'd like for you to sit with throughout is, why are matters of race still matters of concern? And what does that have to do with me? Why are matters of race still matters of concern? And what does that have to do with me? That's what I'd like to explore with you this evening. Um, because we're all kind of challenged with what that, what that means to us. James Baldwin, um, left the United States and moved to France due to the racism he experienced here in the States. And in 1957, when the images of Dorothy Counts was the 15-year-old that was uh, one of the first black students to um, be admitted to Harry Harding High School in the Charlotte, North Carolina city that I live in, um, who experienced this just horrific hatred towards her as she was walking into this integrated school. James Baldwin saw this on the television in, in uh, France, and he wrote about this. He said, we should have been there with her, is what he said. And he went on to say that I could simply no longer sit around Paris discussing the Algerian and the black African-American experience. Everybody was paying their dues, and it was time I went home and paid mine. I must pay my dues. So it brings up the question of what, what is the calling that invokes us showing up to this kind of chronic fatigue, repetitive motion injury of racism that continues to just kind of plague us. What, 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 what do we do with that? What, is, what steps us into a whole nother charge or challenge? What is the charge or challenge that begins to transform this trance of uh, horrific um, pain and injustice that we see? Inflamed, by the way, at this time. And as a elder, this is not the worst times I've seen in my life, but it's, it's kind of up there in terms of how crazy the world is right now and how, how uh, wacky um, things are going. And it's important, I think, that we look at, look at our relationship to that. 
in the Theravada tradition that of Buddhism, which is what my tradition is in, there's a term called Samvega. And Samvega is a Pali term that's interpreted this way. An inner commotion or shock which does not allow us to rest content with our habitual adjustment to the world. Instead, it drives us on out of our cozy palaces and into unfamiliar jungles to work out with diligence the authentic solutions of our existential plight. So James Baldwin says again that a country is only as strong as the people who make it up. And the country turns into what the people want it to become. We made this world we're living in and we have to make it over. So what does that have to do with me? What does that have to do with me? Because I got a lot of opinions about what these folks out here ought to do and how crazy it is. But what does it have to do with me? I often refer to racism as a heart disease that's curable. And one of the reasons I think it's curable is because I think it's, um, it's, it's, it, it requires the heart to, um, I think, to transmute the conditioning that we've all been steeped in, our racial conditioning. It's curable because as humans, we have a capacity to turn around and look at our lives mindfully and unpack that conditioning when we can, we can bear warm-hearted attention to it, warm and wise-hearted attention to it. We can interrupt our habituation. We're all habits. And the good thing about habits is that they can change. Well, what does that take? What does it take for you to pay your dues in, in that sense, in that kind of mechanism of change? So we can't heal this heart disease if we can't talk about race to each other. And most of us have given it our best shot, you know, most of us have stories of being bruised and battered and putting our foot in our mouths and you know, just feeling like we can never get it right, feeling like it's never going to change. This kind of helplessness, hopelessness, shutting down of the heart, being enraged, being on fire, all of these things are ways we feel at, at a loss with how we work with the energetic, with the um, with the uh, nerve with our own nervous systems when it comes to this term. I don't know anybody that can hear the term racism without feeling something. Without feeling something, and it's usually something that's a little terrorizing. So these, in my mind, are issues of belonging. You know, racism is a, is, a, is a belonging issue. In my tradition, again, we have uh, a teaching called the Two Truth Doctrine, and it speaks to the ultimate reality and, and relative reality. In ultimate reality, we're no bodies, right? But in relative reality, we're, we're, we're in these bodies having this experience having our conditioning growing up in our families and all of that. We're in these bodies. We are somebody in relative reality. In relative reality, I'm a woman, I'm black, I'm lesbian, I'm a great grandmother, I'm an author, and I'm a whole lot of other things that I probably won't name tonight. <laughs> I'm all those things people project onto me, you know. I remember Tina Turner saying, everything you've ever heard about me is true. <laughs> so let's move on to the next matter. <laughs> but in ultimate reality, I'm none of those things. I'm not, in, I'm not this concept. I'm not this construct. I'm not this, this thing that, that everybody has kind of constructed, and I have too. 
So these, these two realities are meant to, they're really two expressions of one truth. And we can't wake up to ultimate reality, which is a, a, a mind state of freedom, regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves in. We can't really wake up to that without being in this body, having an experience of being in this body. We can't wake up to our um, biggest selves, if you will, of no self, unless we're willing to rub and be disturbed by each other, be in relationship with each other, be in kinship. Martin Luther King Jr. says, no individual can live alone, no nation can live alone, and anyone who feels that he can live alone, he or she can live alone, is sleeping through a revolution. See, too many of us want racism to go away without attending to it, without being touched by it, and without learning from it. And understanding how we've been conditioned to think and react is at the heart of racial healing and racial um, harming understanding how we got here. What does it take to understand how we got here? You know. It's not information alone that we need. We need deep understanding. This is where the spiritual, you know, the Buddha specialized in suffering. You know. So it makes perfect sense to me in writing this book that dropping the issues of racial distress into the heart of this practice, of, especially of mindfulness, just made a lot of sense because how can I dissect my conditioning in a heartful way without, without destroying myself with my mind, my own mind, my own thoughts? One of the reasons I wrote this book is because everything I was doing wasn't working. I came into the mindfulness arena because the, the, the regular ways of me, my righteousness, my first book was about rage, by the way, but you know, so I kind of got that one a little, not always, but got it a little better. <laughs> you know, my, my regular way of, my habitual ways of doing things weren't, it wasn't working. And even with what I know now about how to be with distress in a, in a warmer way, it still doesn't immediately bring me relief or the issues in the world don't, don't immediately change. What's changed is my relationship to it. What's changed is me understanding that every action I take is planting seeds and I have a responsibility of what gets planted now or in, in, the, in the future. So the, the, the righteousness that I had about what was wrong wasn't enough. It, it was, you can be dead right. So in the work that I do, I offer a framework for having us understand our racial conditioning at the individual level, at the group level, and at the institutional level, looking at our conditioning. And what I'm attempting to do is, is answer a few questions. Actually, it's not answer the questions, but it's really engaging us around four questions. One is, how do I work with my thoughts, fears, and beliefs and ways? <laughs> we, don't, we don't get it right most of the time. <laughs> Just get it all jumbled up. And then we're, you know. It's helpful to pause and look at, have a place, have a, have a mindfulness practice where we can look and slow it down and, and look at how, how our habits of mind, to make friends with them, to let them have their air and space so that they can teach us about ourselves, about our reactivity, about our impulses. It's a sacred space. One of our teachers, Seadal Lutajaniya, says, one thing you need to remember, you cannot leave the mind alone. 
It needs to be watched constantly. If you don't watch your mind, harm will grow and multiply. But here's the best part. He says, the mind does not belong to you, but you're responsible for it. This issue of looking at race is an issue of sila. It's an issue of our ethical conduct and the way we uh, move in the world. And Nelson Mandela says that when we can sit in the face of insanity and dislike and be free from the need to make it different, then we are free. He was free long before he got out of prison. So mindfulness is a powerful tool for us to consider in our um, deconstruction, our decolonization of our racial conditioning. It's a loving way to bear witness to, to, to this, this, this conditioning and to give it air, give it light, give it warmth, to soften around it, to humble yourself, to, to, you know, this is the what's it got to do with me part. And then there are racial affinity groups. And racial affinity groups is another mindfulness structure. And it's a way that we can begin to look at how we've been racially conditioned with people that are our same racial makeup. We're all diverse in our, in our own ways. But I'm suggesting white men get together with white men, white women, white, you know, trans people, you know, however that constellation is. Get together racially with people that are like you and begin to turn your attention inward to look at your conditioning. And in the book, I offer a structure for that and also specific questions that you can begin to engage each other around. And this is a small group of people where you can become more tender and caring and curious where some healing can happen um, from your own presence and the own quality of your attention and intention. Some people say, oh, you know, when you talk about racial affinity groups, you're trying to separate us. No, we're already separate. We're already separate. And this is a way to really exploit that by bringing a certain investigation around race to it. I think racial affinity groups are good for white people because um, one of the questions that could be answered in a, asked in a racial affinity group with white folks is why is it so hard for us to come together and talk about whiteness? Why do I itch and scratch or feel numb or confused or don't know what to do? Or, why, why did that happen? It becomes a question to examine. And of course, when whites are doing the work of whiteness, then people of color are unburdened from that task. They're lightened from it. And people of color can benefit from racial affinity groups because we get a chance to look at what's left out when our focus is so tightly zeroed in on white folks and what they've done. We get a chance to kind of figure out who we are as individuals because we've almost hidden a bit in the group identity piece. And we get a chance to look at um, what it's like if we're not struggling so much. What would we be creating if we weren't so focused on this struggle? Not that there isn't a million and one things to be done, but this is a particular flavor of inquiry that we're doing in racial affinity groups. It's not all the work that needs to be done, but it's a particular focus on looking at our conditioning and caring for each other to wake up around race and to be with the distress around it 
in a more holy way, in a more healthy way. And all of this is leading to a culture of care. How we can um, contribute to a culture of care. How we can bring something more, um, can bring more awareness to the reality of our interdependence. Things start changing when you understand that we really are, we really do belong to each other. That's a hard truth to get our arms around when we're looking at race. It's hard to believe that when we're looking at race. But we do. And I think there's a power in compassion. There's a power in attention and presence. There's a power in understanding that um, what we see is not the whole picture. There's a power in curiosity. And I think that if we weren't in the struggle of racial conflict so much, we'd all be dancing and um, making amazing art in the world. We'd just be all artists. Maybe the next book will be The Buddha, formerly known as The Artist. I don't know. <laughs> so this is, um, has been intended to have you um, uh, consider, you know, why is racism still a matter of concern, and what does this have to do with me? This is not so much an offering about how we fix the issues out there, but I believe that when we fix the issues in here, that how we work with the issues out there will be, um, we'll, we'll plant some different seeds, we'll plant some seeds that have uh, uh, more authenticity, more understanding, more wisdom, more love in the soil. I believe that's true. And I've seen that own blossom in my own life, in my own relationships, in my own softening, my own um, love for all of you. That's, that's why I'm here. Um, some time for any questions or reflections you have. question, take a breath and stand so that we can see you, that would be helpful. If you can. Yes. Great. Great. Um, I just wanted to offer a, a testimony of my I came here with my friend who uh, told me about you, and we were like, wow, this your book is exactly like the book that I'm in this affinity, this white affinity group, which is by Resma Menikin, who's a local, um, <laughs> local trauma uh, therapist, a black trauma therapist. And 
it offers body exercises and basically calls for these affinity groups as well. And uh, being white, it took us three months to get the darn thing together, uh, just to add, you know sort of think of ourselves as a group. Um, but we've been going now for eight months, and what it has done to me is it, it working in my body. I mean, the c comparisons uh, with with the Buddhist your Buddhist approach and this trauma therapist approach are just kind of very similar. Um, it's like, helped me feel in my body my conditioning as a white person, and and realizing the the sort of the um, the um, the tr uh, hurt that I am causing without wanting to, you know, uh, because of my conditioning. <laughs> so um, it's, but it's gradually made me more and more um, want to work with other white people. To the, to even to the extent that we started a community ed class for white people called Unlearning Racism. So anyway, I just it's sort of a testimony to the power of these of these racial affinity groups. Hi, uh, thank you so much for your words tonight. They've been wonderful. Um, uh, I loved the stars and constellations. It was very helpful for me. Uh, one thought that went through my mind as you were describing that was the reports we heard about the the winner of the Green Book or the Green Book winner um, for the best movie, um, and how and, and there was a wonderful uh, the the New York Times evening. Uh, can't remember the name of the show, um, but. Um, the New York Times film critic was talking about how um, disappointing it was and, and how Green Book was a repeat of Driving Miss Daisy and how um, what do you think if you sit in the same room with a person of color for a long enough time it will erase all of your um, thoughts about white privilege and the rest. So it, it, it was um, an education experience for me as older white guy um, to, to see something through that lens. And then just a question, um, you know. I'm curious about what you learned from that. That, that I, um, well, first of all, a touching story. I mean, I love a story like that where I see two people get together and, and find connection. Um, but what I learned from that was that's not the, uh, solution to this problem of race that we have. Um, and as an older white guy, I, I, I often move to fix the thing. I mean, that's sort of a disposition that I have. And you led off by saying that that's exactly a challenge that we have. And my question, have I answered your question yeah, to me? That's fine. Sure. So my question to you is, is some of your thinking behind that approach that um, if we stand back and look at the bigger picture and see the patterns and the root causes that we're more likely to fix things down the road, that's my question to you. If, if, if we're able to step back and see the constellations instead of the stars, then we'll be better able to fix things. Is that part of your objective in what you are... Uh, suggesting we try? That's my question. Um, no, not exactly. Um, it's, it, 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 it's a piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what I'm asking white people to do, um, I'm asking white people to, to, to not be quick to fix things before they understand themselves as a, as a group, as mm -hmm. a group identity, as mm -hmm. until they've done some work on understanding what whiteness is. And I think that work then begins to inform what you do and, and the impact that it has because it's rooted in, in, in a deeper understanding of your own conditioning. So, and, so it, and, and I, I want to caution against this idea because I hear, here's, you didn't say this exactly, but I do hear this stance of white people saying, oh, I'll just sit back and be quiet because I'll, you know, 
Some of that's rooted in, you I didn't say that. I, no, I understand but that. Some of that's rooted in, I don't want to get it wrong, but none of this is about sit back. This is all about turning inward to really examine deeply um, the conditioning around your own race. So that's pretty much the strongest thesis that I have. Understanding the, you know, just how we've been conditioned and then bringing mindfulness to sitting on the cushion is a way of working at it at the individual level. Being in a racial affinity group is a way to work at it at the group level. Look so, at the snowstorm, not the snowflakes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, yeah, look at both, but, but not just one or the other is, is really the opportunity. We're kind of been balanced in our society. And see, I think this kind of examination then informs how we respond to the to, to what, what we do next and, and the plant the seeds we're planting as a result of it. And tell us one more time what you described as privilege. Um, tell me what you heard. I can't, it, it surprised me. Uh, that's all I remember. Uh, mm -hmm. It wasn't what I expected to hear. Okay. Well, I want you to, and I tried I to write it down, but I can't that. write that fast. I want okay. you to sit with that. I, will. I want you to know it's in the book. But I think, I, yeah. I, I think I was lucky. I think the fact that um, that it touched you, or that it kind of has you cooking, that's what I want you to to be with more than anything. I'll work on it. Yeah. Good. Thank you. <laughs> well. Well, thank you so much. Uh, my dear wife and I were at a, a seminar the other day um, about white supremacy, and it was quite enlightening uh, for being an old white guy. Uh, and uh, one of the things I was struck with is, is the complexity of this situation, because I had never thought about the conditioning that people of color have, that they have to deal with in terms of uh, some of their responses, which is not to say that, by golly, we are the ones who have to do the work and to look inside, and I think your advice about that was, uh, was wonderful because uh, it is, it is so deep within us that it's almost invisible. And uh, to, to find that um, is, is a difficult thing, but it is also a hopeful thing. First of all, you're awesome, so thank you. <laughs> um, I guess um, I was just thinking I had a takeaway and then I feel like I'm conflicted too. So, um, so one of my takeaways is to pay attention, you talked about paying attention to my own body and what's going on when I'm having these conversations. And I, well, right now, like my heart's racing. <laughs> also probably because I'm speaking in front of everyone. Um, but uh, I guess I'm in a leadership position where I am talking about race. I'm talking about a lot of equity issues. And I think um, the conflict I see of kind of paying attention to what's going on in my own body, but then also needing to be very careful um, in terms of my expressions, my body, um, making sure not to say the wrong thing. Yeah. Can you just can you speak to that? Do you yeah. see it as a conflict or um, maybe a, something to rethink? Or yeah, just I guess that's what I'm sitting with right now. Yeah. So let me just ask a couple of questions with you, um, which might feel like you're even more in the hot, you know. <laughs> 
Great. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious about, um, let me just speak a little bit and join you in the soil of what you're saying in terms of the leadership and bravery of speaking about this work. Um, and the trepidation, the way the heart quivers when you're feeling so deeply about a topic um, and you can't not talk about it and all that goes with that internally to stand, you know. Um, so that's appropriately complicated. Um, and I find that as a mindfulness practitioner, I find myself more um, uh, careful about my impact because I know that it has impact. So I, I don't, I don't feel like I can afford to get it, to, to just be cavalier about it. At the same time, I can't not say what I need to say, but at the same time, uh, you know, there's these uh, other things that I'm questioning. I'm also questioning my conditioning. I question whether I get to say this. I question whether I know enough. I, you know, so a lot of things can be running culturally a lot of things could be running uh, just from my own nervous system. Um, uh, so, so I think the two pieces of your comment really go together in terms of attending to the body and the breath while also saying what must be said. And, you know, so I would just advise a real slowing it down because we don't want to be in reactivity which takes us off of our own balance. And I didn't, I didn't hear you saying that, but sometimes a charge inside can feel that way. Uh, and sometimes a lesson for us is seeing what happens if we, if we say nothing for a few breaths, just to kind of see what it's like to, to settle in a bit more, see what we're left with, see what might be our attention first. Uh, sometimes we can't afford to take that kind of pause. But I think we can take that pause more than we realize sometimes. So I would invite that. Is this in the soup of what you were? Yes, thank you. And there was someone right there? Yes. Right here with the left there. Hi, thank you for your work. Um, I'm a school teacher and a yoga instructor, so you've kind of hit me hard overall encompassing of, of who you are and the work you do. Um, I guess my question is, and I've kind of been stuck in this, um, some of the toughest reaching people that I'm around tend to be white males that hold coaching positions and teaching positions, and they are with many of our black male students. And so these kiddos, you know, get in conflict with them um, and also look up to them as leaders, but they don't see the big picture of who, who these kiddos are. And I want to best reach kind of these unreachable people to evoke change on, on a student to student level, but bigger as well. And how do I get? To them when I, I am so very different from them mindset wise um, and ideology wise and, and, and get them fully on board and, and in this um, to, to wake up to, to how we make the change. And they'll be happier, I feel like, too. Um, so much are ego. Are you speaking to the, for the, about the students or the white leaders that are kind of in their lives? Uh, can you explain a little bit more? Where, are you saying how do I, how do I help them? Who is it you're trying to help? The students. I'm trying to help the students because that's where I get the the fire in my belly to evoke the change. But ultimately, it will help, you know, these adults as well. But it's so that the the change overall can be be all encompassing. Yeah, that... it's a big question because part of. Part of, I mean, I think that many of us have challenges in the world we're trying to face, 
And the piece my work is intending is for us to really be clear internally mm -hmm. before we do things. So my, my counsel to you would be that you're grounded in an understanding of this within yourself, within your own whiteness, yep. you know, or whatever your racial identity complexity is. And that, um, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe the fire is in the belly with the, with the yogis, but maybe the opportunity is talking to the white folks about, um, yeah, let's talk, let's talk about this as white people and see, see how we can, how we can um, deepen our understanding of our impact. Okay, 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 so now I, I, I'm, okay, so how do we best talk to the white people that don't want to be talked to about it? There you go. Okay, now that, that's a question I can help you with. Okay, you know? thank you. <laughs> so, um, you know, here's the thing. Um, this is why the, the racial affinity group is so important, because it's set up so that there are some agreements up front. Yeah, we're going to do this together. Short of an agreement, you know, that we're going to be on a journey together of looking at our conditioning, then you're in one-on-one -on -one kind of deals with people. Yeah. So, so I, I think that first you need, again, you want to get yourself grounded, get clear, and work with your own activation and charge around it. But if you were to sit and have, uh, if, if, you're, if you're wanting to have a conversation with someone about whiteness, Ask them if they would be willing to, to talk to you about that. Okay. Th that can be just a simple upfront piece. I'm really interested in understanding this myself, and I'm wondering if you would sit down and talk to me. I have some stuff that I think would, would really help both of us. <coughs> Something like that. And if they say no, where do you go with that? Then if they say no, then you're left with what you feel like when you don't get your way. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. I love you. <laughs> right? Because we don't have control over what people choose to do. There's what? A hand in the back? I just want to thank you, first and foremost. Um, I realized that, like, for a while, maybe like 10 years ago, I was trying to have discussions about race with my family, my white affinity group, and I started shying away um, because I the pushback and the inevitable reactions that I would feel. And so I want to verbally pledge to keep myself accountable and to hopefully bring some other accountability from my white affinity group that I will continue to have these discussions even when my voice is shaking and even when I feel uncomfortable and so hopefully some of you will join me in that. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Up there. Okay, hopefully this question makes sense because it doesn't make sense in my head when I'm trying to think about it. All right. Um, so you said be aware and don't be enraged, correct? Or did I, because I have two younger brothers, um, one that's nine, one that's going on 19. How do I not be enraged when so many African American boys are being like killed for just being themselves? Because I'm afraid of my brothers going outside the house and even just getting behind a cop car. You know, even when I'm in a cop car, I'm like, okay, three is nine, um, my mirror's a gun, I'm signaling. Mm -hmm. Like what else? should I feel? Because like, the 19 year old wants to become a cop, but he's black. You know, he's already on two different sides of the world already. You have two things going against you, you know? He's short, he's black, wants to be a cop. Yeah. The other nine year old is, you know, he looks up to cops. Yeah. So what else can I feel if I feel just rage, if I feel scared yeah. or hurt? Yeah. Well, I understand the rage for it. Yeah. And, uh, and we can't not feel what we're feeling, so um, I hope I didn't say don't feel rage, because because I I I kind of put it on a little pedestal on my altar and make sure it has a regal spot <laughs> with regularity. There's plenty to be enraged about. I think we we get to a place, and it's really hard being a a a, a mother, being a parent, especially a black kid. If I got a grandson in jail right now that I'm dealing with um, due to bipolar 
and 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 all of the confusion and projections that you know he shouldn't be in jail. He should, you know, I mean, and he's an adult, so there's all that complexity. We have lots of reasons for our heart to be uh, enraged, and um, what's underneath it often is just terror and fear because we can't protect them. We can't fix it. We can't always um, make sure they're never going to be harmed. So at, at some point, I think we get to, to where we look at the, the harm that the rage is causing us. And that the fuel the, the, and the, the charge that's all wrapped around it, the story around it, the fear around it, needs some comfort and attention. Your, your body wants some relief from this distress of the harsh reality you're living with. So at some point, we want to begin to attend to that. It doesn't mean that the rage isn't worthy. It means that we, we need to love it and to uh, form a fuel that is not killing us from the inside out. Um, so your, your heart, it makes sense that there would be, you know, we have deities in the t Tibetan tradition that, that are rageful and wrathful. Um, but it's, 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 it's like a mother's rage of protection. It's not about doing harm, it's, it's about honing that. So uh, the practice, I think, of um, a sitting practice where you can comfort the rage, allow it to be there without doing harm to you and others. You know, that means you're gonna be right working with it, comes a practice. Um, but to not hate that it's there and to not hate at all. And see if there's a way to be with, um, the situation so that uh, hate is not a part of the equation. I mean, see if there's a way to be with rage without hate being in the mix. Yeah. And just one more, maybe? Maybe two more. Okay. I've been stuck from the beginning about the, Shelley's comments about um, uh, kind of challenging us to do something in our own lives to promote racial equality and justice. And um, I've been stuck, but I just want to do now what I try to do, one little thing I try to do, and that's promote the number of theater. Um, for help, those of you that don't know, it's an African American uh, theater group. It's just a few miles straight down the road here. Uh, Sarah Bellamy does a fabulous job, and it's not just black theater. It's uh, they do a lot of programs, they have movies and discussions, and it's a really, it's a cultural gym. I don't think there's another theater like it in the country that I know of. And um, I don't know if you have any familiar, familiar with it at all, but uh, I just wanted to, to do that. Thank you so much. Have you heard of the Penumbra Theater in No. Okay, it's a gym, it's, I think it's yeah. something that's... And um, on the one hand, I could see how he could say that. Um, and on the other, I was aware how engaging him on that topic would require me to look at my economic privilege. And as the conversation gets bigger, it could require me to look at my sexual orientation privilege or lack of it. And I guess my question is, do you think that, that these examinations are, are best done in isolation? Or can they be done, I mean, can we be having affinity groups of heterosexuals to look at heterosexism and racial affinity groups to, to look at racial affinity and economic groups to look at economic affinity, do they have to be done one by one? Oh, that's a good question. And, um, and you're really speaking to the complexity of, of us humans and that these, we've got many identities, not just racial identities. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's certainly, um, and there's, it's certainly been done where people have gotten together that are the same. 
sexual orientation and gender and you know it's it's been done it 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 it, it none of this is done enough um, but I find uh, the reason I carved race out of the social ills of the multitudes <laughs> is because I think it's the most charged, the most avoided, um, you know, and I think that um, for white people is the most avoided. So I think that It can be an experiment of seeing what it's like when the focus is just on race. It's been my experience with racial affinity groups, for example, that when white folks get together and it's white um, and, and it's mixed gendered, then gender ends up trumping the discussion on race. It just happens time and time again because there's just so much rage around that dynamic, you know. It's another one of the Dom sub dances that the same skeletal shape of individual group and institution, dominance and subordination, fits with any um, any any group, whether it's gender. So yeah, it can be separate, but I challenge I challenge people to give race give race some real attention, especially in this flavor that I'm offering. That's an internal inquiry. A lot of racial affinity groups form and they're looking at how they learn about other races and how they go out and do some social justice activity. All of that's good, but I'm kind of inviting a certain internal examination of our habits of mind that I think hasn't been done, which I think could be a deal changer, actually. Thank you so much. That was a great question. So, um, let me see what time it is. So before I turn this over to Mark, I just want you to turn to the person next to you and repeat after me one more time. Pick a person nearby. Take a breath. And say out loud, if I didn't belong to you, I wouldn't be here. If you didn't belong to me, you wouldn't have come. Your heart and my heart are very old friends. All right. <laughs> much for that. Um, I feel like there's so much for me that I'm marinating in and sort of learned to, to step up as a person of color. Um, I'm Katie Kabang. I'm the new executive director of Clouds and Water. Um, we are so happy to have been a co-sponsor of this event with uh, Common Grounds and we look forward to seeing so much more of you all and working with Common Ground. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. So first I want to thank Ruth so much. I'm so happy that we were able together to create this wider event and basically share Ruth with the wider Minneapolis and St. Paul community. And just again, Ruth, your clarity and the goodness and love coming out of your heart really helps us do this work. So I'm so grateful that you're here and really grateful that Ruth will be here this weekend doing different trainings uh, for our communities. And I also want to acknowledge Mark Berkson and the entire Hamlin University community. 
it's just such a privilege to work with a big institution that, I don't know, just feels very personal. <laughs> and you have amazing resources. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really great to partner. And uh, we've done it a few times with Clouds and Water Zen Center, right not that far in St. Paul, beautiful Dharma Center, Buddhist Meditation Center. So uh, it's just really great. Hopefully this is just the beginning. Carol and Katie, thank you so much for your work. And uh, some of you know, but uh, Ruth is a high-powered trainer in this world of unraveling oppression, doing anti-racism work. And Kamgra made a serious investment in bringing her here, and it makes us really happy to have done that. Knowing that we're helping your livelihood is a great, great feeling. And you can have that great feeling, too. <laughs> Because we've got a beautiful bowl out there that one of our community members painted a long time ago. And any money that comes in there, checks, cash, or you can go, I think uh, Gabe has some uh, iPad or some square readers, so you can donate by credit card if you want. And that just helps us recover the costs of bringing Ruth in to do this kind of training. And you get to be part of that beautiful circle of giving and receiving. You can think about Ruth when she gets a little time off from her travel schedule back in Charlotte with her partner having a great time with her cat in a nice house. <laughs> and it will make you happy. It will make you happy forever. So whatever makes sense, whatever makes you happy, please contribute for that. And we hope to see you either at Clouds and Water or Common Ground Meditation Center or some of the programs that Mark mentioned earlier. Can they find that on your website, those trainings that are coming up? Yes, I hope you can ask the center, but my email is also one from the previous, you know, village department, um, right email, and always there. Great. Anything else, Shelly, we should announce? Yeah, we recorded. So, it will be up at both the Common Ground and probably somewhere at Hamlet. So maybe, on behalf of everyone in the room, thank you so much for So feel free to stay, get a book. Ruth is going to sit out next to the books if you want to have it signed. And thank you to Hamlin for the nice reception. Stay around, have a conversation. <laughs>